In his native South Korea, Dr. Hwang Woo Suk was a national hero. He first burst onto the scene in 1999 as a cloning pioneer. In 2004 and 2005, he published two papers in the world-renowned journal Science. Huang's work was hailed as groundbreaking, and he parlayed that attention into a large public and private backing. Dr. Huang seemed to be on the fast track to a Nobel Prize. He seemed to do no wrong until it all came crashing down. In this video, we're going to take a look at the rise and fall of Dr. Huang Wu Sok. But first, I want to remind you about the newsletter. Check out the newsletter to read the entire scripts for previously released videos, including those you might not have seen before. The sign-up link is in the video description below. I try to put one out every week, maybe two. All right, back to the show. Huang was born in 1952 in Buyo County of Korea's South Chungcheong province. Huang's father died when he was young, so he was raised by his mother. Growing up on a cattle farm, he dreamed of becoming a world-class cattle researcher. With the help of his relatives and scholarships, he entered and graduated from Seoul National University, one of the country's most prestigious universities in veterinary sciences, class of 1977. He received his doctorate a few years later in 1982, where he was noted for working hours on end without sleep. After that, he went abroad to Hokkaido University for a couple of years as a visiting researcher. After that, he returned to South Korea and joined Seoul National University as a lecturer. He became an associate professor in 1993 and then ascended to a full professor at the veterinary school in 1997. Huang's research throughout the 1990s was on in vitro fertilization. He was well regarded as an expert in livestock breeding. In 1993, he performed Korea's first artificial insemination of a cow. A good career, certainly, but nothing to cross the front page news. The South Korean government has long wanted to make a splash in the biosciences. Back in the 1980s, the military junta, led by Chun Du Hwan, wanted to replicate the economic success of the previous Pak Chung Hee administration. It was an anxious time. South Korea's economy was changing from relying upon cheap labor and cheap energy to knowledge and science. The government was gearing up a massive R&D program in several priority areas. Several Korean life science researchers lobbied the Ministry of Science and Technology to include biotechnology as a priority for R&D expenditure. From 1983 to 1994, national R&D expenditures on biotechnologies skyrocketed nearly 20 times. Then in 1994, the Kim Yong-sam government announced that it would spend 18 to 20 billion USD over the next 14 years on its biotechnology industry. This ambitious plan, called Biotech 2000, made up a significant part of the country's highly advanced nation development plan. The goal would be for Korea to catch up to other developed nations by 2007. Dr. Huang first went mainstream in August 1998 when he announced that he had cloned a dairy cow named Yongrong Yi, which means splendor in Korean, and that it would be born in January 1999. This cloned cow, later announced to be born in February 1999, drew nationwide attention as Korea's response to the February 1997 UK news announcement about the sheep Dolly, the first mammal to be cloned from an adult somatic cell. Somatic cell, meaning that the cell is not a reproductive cell. The United States had previously cloned two calves the same way in January 1998, Charlie and George, scientists from Japan and New Zealand as well. So Korea joined them as only the fifth country to accomplish this high-profile achievement. But people did point out a few weird things surrounding the announcement. First, Huang did not publish a paper about his clone achievement though he did later file patents detailing some of the techniques he used to produce the clone. Second, the first announcement said that the cow would be born in January, but it ended up being born in February. Can a cow delay pregnancy that long? These accusations did not prevent Huang from being identified as a promising world-class representative scientist. But knowing what we know now, was the cow cloning achievement legitimate? We cannot say for sure, both Yong Rong Yi and its cell donor passed away soon after the news left the spotlight. Dr. Huang's team did provide a sample for third-party verification, but it had deteriorated too much for a conclusive result. So genetic testing cannot authenticate this particular achievement, but there is some circumstantial evidence that implies that the cloning was legitimate. 
get to that later. I think it is worth taking a pause to explain the procedures and techniques behind Huang's work. Somatic cell nuclear transfer is what we call the technique used to clone Dolly the sheep. We first collect two types of cells. The first is a somatic cell from the person or sheep we mean to clone. Like I said before, a somatic cell refers to a non-reproductive cell. Cloners generally choose cells from the skin or memory glands. Then we need to collect a second type of cell, egg cells from a female of the same species. These should be ready to be fertilized. We then remove those egg cells' nucleus using a needle. From there, we fuse together the donor somatic cell into the now nucleusless egg cell. This can be done using electricity or a direct injection into the cell. This new egg cell is then made to develop into an embryo, and then we finally implant it into a surrogate mother for it to develop just like with any in vitro fertilization. Voila, we have a clone. This technique was first proposed in the 1930s, first done on frogs, Technical and biological limitations in manipulating egg cells meant that we weren't able to do this for mammals until Dolly. Also, one last thing, clones aren't really clones like in the movies due to developmental differences and other such things. It was for this reason that the first cloned cat, named Cece for copycat, came out with a different colored coat. The dream, of course, would be able to produce cell therapies customized to a particular patient especially those suffering from degenerative diseases like Parkinson's. But the process has its drawbacks. The most significant is the low success rate. It took 277 tries to get Dolly. Only 29 ever became embryos, and less than half of that got to be implanted. Despite a few optimizations, we have yet to really improve these rates in the years since Dolly's birth. They remain in the low 1-5% to range, depending on the species. For instance, a recent study on monkeys got 4 live births out of 301 embryos, a 1.8% yield. Also, if you're going to be using this technology to try and heal people, you need to consider the ethical issues surrounding the destruction of an unfertilized human egg cell. Dr. Huang was not only handsome and looked like the perfect ideal of an academic, he also savvily tapped Korean nationalist feelings. For instance, Dr. Huang followed up his achievement with a second clone cow in April 1999. He named it Jin Yi, based on the famous Korean geisha Huang Jin Yi from the Joseon dynasty, a name suggested by the Korean president Kim Dae-jong. In an interview with reporters, Huang said he wanted to improve the production capacity of native Han Wu Korean beef in order to improve its price competitiveness against imported beef and increase farmers' income. He also thoroughly bought into the hustle culture life. In one interview, he said, My calendar has only Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Friday. There is no Saturday or Sunday. His remarks brought pride and inspiration at a time when Koreans needed a hero. Just a few years earlier, in late November 1997, South Korea had to take a humbling $60 billion IMF bailout package in the wake of the Asian financial crisis. Dr. Huang followed up his cloning achievement with a few more announcements. Some interesting and others a bit strange. First in 2002, he announced that he had cloned a pig with its genes modified to make it more conducive for organ transplant. Huang had an interesting story for these aseptic pigs, as they were called. He said that due to quarantine restrictions, he could not bring live pigs in from the United States. So he claimed to have smuggled in pig embryos, which he cloned. He compared the smuggling to that of the famous scholar and politician Meng Ikjom, who smuggled cotton seeds out of China into Korea. Those seeds founded a fruitful cotton industry for the country. A year later, in December 2003, he announced that he had successfully genetically engineered a Korean cow to be resistant to mad cow disease. Like with the prior announcements, there was no paper published for peer review. He also told reporters that he wanted to clone the Siberian tiger and the Korean wild wolf because those heritage animals were facing extinction in their natural environment. I don't think anything came of that. In the wake of the news, Huang invited the Korean president, No Mu Hyung, to his laboratory. There, he demonstrated to the president how he cured a dog using a stem cell treatment. One of No's leading political goals when he came to power in February 2003 was scientific advancement. He upgraded the Ministry of Science and Technology to a Deputy Prime Minister position, 
in charge of coordinating the country's research. President No was amazed by Huang's achievement, saying, I feel like I got an electric shock. This is not science, this is magic. Huang and the No administration had close ties through one of the president's advisors, Dr. Park Ki Yong. Huang donated a quarter of a million dollars to fund her research regarding the social impact of his laboratory discoveries. She helped boost his work and career through targeted policy. In February 2004, Dr. Huang published a paper in the world-renowned journal Science. In it, he claims to have produced a human embryonic stem cell via the somatic cell nuclear transfer method. While it has been done before in animals, this was the first time it has been performed for humans. Science and Nature are two of the world's most prestigious journals, with an acceptance rate of less than 10%. So the 2004 paper triggered a swell of nationalist pride, which he cultivated. At a press conference in Seoul, he said, At the heart of the United States, I just put Teguki on top of the mountain of biotechnology, which once had been believed to be unreachable by 2010. The Teguki is the name of the Korean national flag, also the name of a great 2004 film that I highly recommend. The Korean government had backed their star scientist's research to the tune of over $65 million, allowing his lab at Seoul National University to grow to employ 60 people. In return, Dr. Huang included Dr. Park, the president's science advisor, as a co-author on this 2004 paper. A year later, in June 2005, he had a second paper published in Science. In it, he said that his research team produced 11 human stem cell lines from people of various ages and sexes. Just as significantly, he claimed to have produced this using just 185 eggs via somatic cell nuclear transfer. Such an achievement, if legitimate, would have been a big breakthrough. It would have shown it to be possible to create stem cells out of many different people's somatic cells. As I mentioned earlier, such an achievement, if legitimate, opens the door to custom-made cell therapy treatments for afflicted patients free of immune rejection concerns. Furthermore, 11 cell lines out of just 185 eggs implies a success rate some 14 times better than anything done before. It would have been a wild achievement, if legitimate. As a confirmation of his work's global nature, Huang's two articles included prominent American scientists as co-authors. The second 2005 paper included Dr. Gerald Shatton, a scientist well-known in South Korea. And a few months later, Dr. Huang's team announced the world's first successful cloning of a dog. This was an Afghan hound born in April 2005 named Snuppy. The name is short for Seoul National University Puppy. Time later chose Snuppy as its most amazing invention in 2005. Much later, two separate third parties from Seoul National University and Princeton verified Snuppy as a legitimate clone of his nuclear cell donor. Considering this, I reckon that Dr. Huang's original clone cow was also legitimate. The Snuppy clone is indeed pretty cool, but it is a bit overshadowed by some of the other things he has done. Coming so soon after these two publications in a prestigious journal, Huang became a national hero. No individual Korean scientist received so much mass media attention. Various TV networks featured him in various TV segments. At his press conferences, he made rousing nationalist statements like, I want to print Made in Korea on stem cells, and Science knows no border, but a scientist has his homeland. Then in October 2005, the No administration appointed him to lead a new world stem cell hub with the goal of creating the world's leading research center for stem cell technologies. The government granted him tens of millions of dollars in funds to be spent over five years at the hub. Some of Korea's largest private companies like Samsung and POSCO also contributed to Huang's projects. The South Korean government awarded Huang the Best Scientist Award in June 2005. They issued a commemorative stamp with Huang's work on it. And the best perk of all, Korean Air granted both him and his wife free passage on their flights, first class. One late evening in June 2005, two producers of a TV investigative program called PD Notebook saw an interesting post on their discussion board. Titled, About Professor Huang, the author wrote, I worked at Professor Huang's laboratory for a few years. Dr. Huang is a national hero, and people respect him truthfully. 
I was hesitant to write this story here because I don't have strong evidence, and Professor Huang is one of the most influential scientists in Korea. After I tell the truth about his research to the public, Korea might lose international reputation in stem cell cloning field, and I would be in danger. However, I believe that we cannot hide the truth, and a reputation based on dishonesty should be quickly removed. Please contact me. The producers reached out to the Post's author, who left their real name and number, and met with them. Dr. Ryu Young Jun was the first medical doctor to work at Huang's lab, having joined them in 2002. He worked on procuring the eggs from various clinics, preserving stem cells, and drafting the paper. Ryu was the second listed co-author on the 2004 paper. He eventually left Huang's laboratory and returned to medicine. He initially kept his silence but decided to go public when he found out that Dr. Huang intended to treat a 10-year-old boy with his stem cell therapies. Knowing the real effectiveness of Huang's work, Ryu had to speak out. The first issue that Ryu brought up was that of younger female researchers being quote-unquote encouraged to donate their eggs. Ryu also told the producers that the eggs used in Huang's stem cell research were paid for rather than donated. Furthermore, the women donors were not told about the possible side effects of the egg extraction. Ryu's wife also worked at Dr. Huang's laboratory and had been one of the many co-authors on the 2004 article. She backed his statement that some of the laboratory's junior members donated their own eggs. The second thing that Ryu told the producers was that he felt that the stem cell data in both the 2004 and 2005 science articles might have been faked. Let us set aside Ryu's second accusation and focus on the eggs first. By the time Ryu reached out to PD Notebook, people had already started asking questions about the eggs. Egg extraction is painful and can potentially cause side effects, so such a process should be overseen. So a few people wondered how Huang managed to acquire so many eggs. Dr. Huang told the New York Times in a February 2004 interview that the 242 human eggs used in the first paper came from 16 unpaid volunteers. Dr. Huang reaffirmed this position in May 2004 when the journal Nature, the journal that did not publish the paper, also questioned the source of the eggs. It was the first serious pushback regarding his research. It included an initial testimony from a PhD student in Huang's lab and co-author on the paper, saying that she and a colleague had donated eggs. She later called back and said that she had misspoken due to her bad English. Huang said, Nature's claim is totally groundless. I swear none of my students donated eggs for the research. For some reason, the journal is trying to undermine our study. Nature's published accusation probably should have spurred an investigation by the South Korean government and the Hanyang University Hospital's Internal Review Board, or IRB. But both organizations backed Dr. Huang, saying that his work had gone through a full IRB and regulatory review, which it hadn't. The IRB had requested monthly reports considering the sensitive nature of human egg collection, but none were sent. The IRB approved the whole thing anyway. The South Korean government voiced their support for Huang as well. Presidential advisor Dr. Park repeatedly defended the country's star scientist, and the ministry raised their financial support to $30 million, the highest number yet. To prove his accusations, Ryu led the PD notebook producers to excellent documentation at the hospital where Dr. Huang sourced his eggs. Records also shown that at least one of the donors had been a junior researcher at Huang's lab. Now let us touch upon the second data fabrication accusation. Ryu had left Huang's lab after December 2003, so his assertion that the 2005 paper's data was faked was not based on any hard evidence. Ryu's reasoning was that Dr. Huang was indeed out of his element when it came to producing human stem cells. So he had recruited a few experts from other institutions to help, but many of them had left. The stem cell's high success rate was already very suspicious. Huang's team then lost a great deal of experience and domain knowledge. How was it possible that they succeeded so well? PD Notebook producers contacted the various co-authors of the 2005 paper under the cover story of doing a documentary. They found that the majority of the co-authors never saw the 11 stem cell lines in question. Through an undisclosed source, they obtained a sample of one of the 11 stem cell lines from Huang's laboratory, number 2. They tested it against stem cell lines widely available from a hospital for research, produced using in vitro fertilization. If Huang's research was what it said it was, then the results should show different genetics. 
After all, these 11 stem cell lines are supposed to be clones of a random, undisclosed patient. They should be different from the widely available stem cell lines. But indeed, there was a match. They took these results to an October 2005 interview with Kim Sun Jong, who had worked on the human stem cells as a junior researcher. He had by then moved on to the University of Pittsburgh. Unbeknownst to Kim, one of the producers had a hidden camera. They told Kim that they had evidence of fraud and that prosecutors had begun an investigation. Kim cracked and said that Huang had told him to fabricate photographic evidence so to make it seem like there were 11 stem cell lines when in fact there were only two. PD Notebook eventually produced two episodes. The first, Suspicious Egg Donation and Wu Suk Huang's Myth, focused on the ethical egg donations. The information about the fabricated stem cell evidence would come in the second episode. Shortly before the first episode aired on November 22, 2005, Huang's most prominent Western science collaborator, the American stem cell scientist Dr. Gerald Shatton, announced that he would end his collaboration with Huang. Shatton told the Washington Post that his decision was due to the egg ethics. I now have information that leads me to believe Huang had misled me about egg donation. My trust has been shaken. I am sick at heart. No Song Il, chairman of Ms. Medi Women's Hospital, which closely collaborated with Huang, held his own press conference a day before the episode aired, saying that some of the other eggs were purchased from clinics and brokers at about $1,400 each. Then the actual program aired, showing the medical record proof of the unethical egg acquisitions for the 2004 paper. The episode really kicked the hornet's nest. Dr. Ryu had actually talked to a civic group first, but while they believed him, they didn't go loud because they were worried about the social repercussions, for good reason. A few days after the first PD Notebook episode aired on November 24th, Dr. Huang held a press conference and confirmed that two of his junior researchers had indeed donated their eggs. He also admitted that he knew about it but lied to hide their privacy. Huang denied coercing his researchers for donations and claimed to know nothing about the paid egg acquisitions, but he nevertheless said that he would be resigning from his official positions, including that of the stem cell hub. Public opinion in Korea sided with Huang. Many voiced the feeling that we shouldn't apply Western standards of ethics to Asian scientific efforts. Doesn't the average office worker sacrifice their body for the company's greater good every day? Why can't a junior researcher donate their eggs to a science project of national importance? Yahoo Korea held a poll, and 86% of the 10,000-plus respondents did not consider what Huang's laboratory did to be an ethical violation. The second episode would be the real bombshell, the one claiming that Huang faked his data. The problem was that the producers obtained one of the two critical pieces of evidence under false pretenses. The PD Notebook producer had lied to Dr. Kim in Pittsburgh in order to obtain a confession. The producers wanted to solidify their second piece of evidence, the test results. In November, PD Notebook acquired samples for the 11 stem cell lines from Huang's team and sent them to two labs for testing confirmation. The labs came up with just one valid result out of several marks, showing no match with the patient. A retest would be needed, but Huang's team refused to provide any more samples. So to push them to cooperate, the producers of PD Notebook held a press conference on December 2nd, hinting that the 2004 and 2005 papers might have been faked. This backfired. Two days later, December 4th, a competing network, YTN, exposed this breach of journalist ethics. They interviewed Dr. Kim again, who retracted his entire testimony, saying that all the data in the 2005 paper was genuine. That same day, Huang's lab held a press conference to refute the test data. Researcher Professor Kang Song Kong argued that the November test results should be invalidated, since the results were not replicable, because only one of the marks had a result. YTN's accusations led to a public uproar, especially from Huang supporters. 20,000 angry comments filled up PD Notebook's discussion board. Korean netizens figured out the whistleblower's identity, Dr. Ryo, and sent him death threats. He lost his hospital job and could not find another one until 2007. They made a 2014 movie about his ordeal, as well as that of PD Notebooks, called The Whistleblower. 
12 Korean companies pulled their commercials from the program. The network made a public apology and pulled the second episode before it aired. They also suspended the two producers for their unethical misconduct. On December 5th, a day after YTN Network's ethics accusation and Huang's laboratory team press result, an anonymous user posted on the Biological Research Information Center BRIC, message board, a board frequented by young science researchers. The post was titled in English, The Show Must Go On, and detailed how the different photos of the 11 stem cell lines in the 2005 science paper were just one photo, manipulated in Photoshop. Huang's lab team quickly explained that what happened was just a mix-up, and that the science paper would post the real photos shortly. Then came a second brick post, alleging that the DNA fingerprints between the patients and their stem cells in the 2005 paper were unrealistically similar. Small differences should be expected due to how the testing goes, but in Huang's paper, they were precisely the same. On December 8th, 30 professors at Seoul National University urged the administration to investigate. On December 11th, the university formed an investigative committee, but even at this time, people still largely believed in their hero scientist. Then it all collapsed. On December 14th, Dr. Gerald Shatton asked to retract his name from the 2005 Nature paper and urged his other co-authors to do the same. Dr. Shatton also asked Nature to retract the paper in full. He said, My careful re-evaluation of published figures and tables, along with new problematic information, now cast substantial doubts about the paper's accuracy. On the 15th, PD Notebook moved to air their second episode, including the now blurred out video of Kim explaining that he was asked by Dr. Huang to fabricate nine of the 11 stem cell lines. That same day, No Sung Il of the Ms. Medi Hospital, co-author on the 2005 paper and the guy who previously confirmed the ethical egg breaches, did a phone interview. In it, No said that he had visited Huang at the hospital. Dr. Huang had self-hospitalized himself for exhaustion and heard that 9 of the 11 stem cell lines were definitely faked. The remaining two were questionable. A day later, Dr. Huang himself emerged from the hospital and admitted that the 2005 paper had irrecoverable intentional mistakes. He nevertheless insisted that he did indeed clone patient-specific stem cells and that Korea still possessed that precious core technology. The dream of Korean-made stem cells was still alive. But the Seoul National University panel eventually concluded that those last two stem cell lines were created using normal in vitro fertilization. Their report said that Huang had deferred to Kim, the Pittsburgh researcher, to do the work. In October 2004, Kim failed to cultivate the stem cells after many tries and in a fit of frustration went to Ms. Medi to acquire stem cells. He then mixed them into the experimental lines. They grew and he claimed success. Huang did not realize the misconduct and was ecstatic. Kim went to Ms. Medi again and made five more lines for a total of six. But in January 2005, an accident contaminated all but two of those lines. Huang, wanting to publish as soon as possible, told Kim to fabricate photo and data evidence for nine more lines so to end up with 11. Tests showed that none of the existing stem cell lines matched the patient's genetic profiles. They had all come from Ms. Medi. Nobody but Kim knew this. Research done much later also seemed to hint that Huang's team inadvertently triggered parthogenesis, asexual reproduction in their human eggs. Scientifically significant and worth noting, though not what they were actually trying to do. On January 20, 2006, Nature officially retracted the two papers. Huang had attempted to resign from his position as a professor at Seoul National back in his December 2005 press conference, but the university would not accept it. Honor reasons, I think. On February 2006, the university suspended him, and the month after that, they fired him. The Korean public prosecutor took up the case, and watchdog organizations began investigating Huang's use of public research funds. Huang had mixed together public research and private use funds, laundering the money through a series of accounts to make it impossible to track down their true source. He was indicted for embezzlement and ethical violations. After a trial, the judge gave him a suspended sentence for showing remorse. Though he was fired from the university for fraud, he was never indicted for it in court. 
Dr. Shatton said in a March 2006 interview, It began as a little lie, but snowballed with the passage of time. He was continuously under great pressure to produce something. Personally, he had great tenacity about winning the Nobel Prize. He was so anxious to keep his lies from surfacing and to win the Nobel Prize. Shatton goes on to point out that Huang was a veterinary doctor. He and his colleagues had not been equipped to handle the ethics and rigor of a human study, and it cost them. Dr. Huang remains in the biotechnology field. As I mentioned way back, his cloning achievement of Snuppy was legitimate. So he has parlayed that work into a company for producing animal clones, mostly champion pigs, cows, and horses, but the occasional dog for rich clients willing to pay the fifty dollars to $100,000 to do it. Vanity Fair did an interview with him a few years back. I read it and got the sense he seems much happier now. I'm glad to hear that. There are still people who support Dr. Huang, including members of the I Love Huang Wu Suk Club. They consider him the victim of a conspiracy, which resulted in Korea's indigenous technology being stolen by foreigners. Meanwhile, in 2012, Dr. Shinya Yamanaka and Dr. John Gurdon won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their 2006 discovery of transforming ordinary adult skin cells into pluripotent stem cells. The dream lives on. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.